So, thank you. So I wanted to start out with, you know, this concept of health technology assessment. Essentially because, uh, first of all, what's a health technology? Because a lot of the methods are designed around uh, novel pharmaceuticals. Because small molecules, small molecule pharmaceuticals are the most uh, numerous and usually at the frontier of innovation. So, you know, novel drugs like, you know, cancer drugs, uh, cholesterol drugs, and others. But, you know, health technologies are really not infinite, but, uh, you know, there are thousands of different healthcare interventions, ranging from medications and drugs and vaccines to things like, you know, doing surgery in a different way, or implementing an intervention in a different way, or organizing care in a different way. So the broad field uh, is, you know, all the interventions that you can think about in healthcare, but the methods are designed uh, predominantly around the introduction of new pharmaceuticals. And, you know, for pharmaceuticals, there's basically three traditional steps, which are you need to prove safety and you need to prove effectiveness or efficacy. And then you also need to prove uh, quality. And, you know, there's a regulatory component there. And increasingly, you need to, in, to prove value around the world. The last 20 years, there's been, you know, essentially a fourth hurdle. And at the center of that fourth hurdle is economic evaluation, uh, principally cost-effectiveness analysis. And uh, budget impact analysis is one of the two main branches of the economic component of health technology assessment. And budget impact analysis essentially works as a complement to traditional cost effectiveness analysis, so a broader field of economic evaluation. Now I'll talk about the consumers of budget impact analysis, uh, but you know, usually it's some sort of stakeholder or policymaker, and usually it's to support a reimbursement of formulary decision. And in the context of low-income countries, which is my primary area of work and my interest, a lot of the guidance and a lot of the methods are basically not well developed, not because people don't do good studies, but because uh, there hasn't been work put into developed guidance that's specific to low-income countries. But this is not just budget impact analysis. This is essentially uh, all of science. All the methods are developed around the challenges and problems of high-income countries. So, but who pays for healthcare? And, you know, I like this paper is by Joe Dillman uh, in 2016. And, you know, if you look at the U.S., in 2040, each American will spend nearly $17,000 on healthcare. And that is compared to a country like Kenya, which will spend $200 on healthcare in 2040. These are projections, of course, based on modeling. But I want you to see who pays. So the government is the predominant payer in nearly all, uh, nearly all jurisdictions. <coughs> with uh, the exception of, you know, very poor countries. And I'll talk about the very poor countries because, so essentially for the very poor countries like Mozambique and Kenya, then the biggest share is out of pocket spending. And it's a very, very tough one to manage because the, so who's the stakeholder? Who's the decision maker in out of pocket? It's the patient. And you can't develop guidance for each patient because each patient is different and everyone has different means. So essentially how that works is that if you can afford uh, the intervention, then you pay for it. And so uh, manufacturers price at the margin as profit maximizers. But if it's the government, so if it's this one here, sorry about my slides a little bit. Uh, faint, but this is the government column. If it's the government, like in high income countries and upper middle income countries, then you can use the government's force of purchase to negotiate with manufacturers. 
same thing as for prepaid here is essentially predominantly but not exclusively health insurance. So if you're a big health insurance company like Kaiser or like in this region, Primera, then you have some bargaining power. But the out of pocket here is tricky. Now there's another column here which is essentially uh, donors. And if you look at Kenya, for example, and Mozambique, nearly half of Mozambique's healthcare budget is projected to be donors. So essentially the agency, when you do an analysis, you're trying to pitch a donor. So if you're doing an analysis in Kenya, by all means USAID has to be at the table because of their sheer force of expenditure within that context. So why do you need these studies? Why, why do budget impact studies? And we'll talk a little bit about the definition of budget impact, but essentially budget impact studies are not economic evaluations in the traditional sense of the word because economic evaluations have a cost side as well as an outcomes or benefits side. Now, uh, budget impacts are essentially accounting processes. And in fact, a good accountant uh, collaborating with you know, a health economist or uh, an epidemiologist would do a very good budget impact analysis because it's an accounting exercise. And it's an accounting exercise to project how a given budget would change uh, with the introduction of a new intervention. And why is it important is because essentially one of the main things is that new interventions function in a given jurisdiction or in a given patient population through the cost offset. So if I vaccinate a population for HPV, I spend money on the front end and save money down the road in reducing the healthcare costs of cervical cancer. But usually there's a discordance between the budget holder or the policymaker and intervention benefits. And one big example is productivity costs. So if you reduce people's inability to work, uh, by curing them of illness, the person who runs the healthcare budget is uninterested in what uh, people in the labor force, people who run labor forces uh, would get a benefit of. So their budget says nothing about the broader societal benefits of a healthcare intervention. So the Bureau of Labor, uh, the Bureau of Labor uh, Economics in the US, for example, or you know, a government wants a healthy population, but uh, the healthcare budget is the healthcare budget. So from the perspective of society, it might make sense, but the budget for this person in the Ministry of Health, for example, is limited. The other thing is that you can't transfer savings. So if someone runs an outpatient clinic, but uh, treating early reduces hospital costs, they still have their fixed budget. In fact, it's not just a question of transferring within the health sector. You can't even transfer out between sectors. So for example, if you, I study alcohol use disorder, if you reduce alcohol use disorder, then there are benefits to, uh, to the policing department or to crime and punishment, uh, depending on you know, who, who does that. But then you can't, they can't give you the savings the police department can't give you the savings to apply to your healthcare. So there's that discordance as well. Uh, the other thing I already talked about is that temporary impact, which means that you know, if you do preventive interventions, uh, you can't always get the money back in the long term. So if you vaccinate 13 year olds against HPV, the benefits are when they are 50 and the budget holders jurisdiction is only in the short term. So before you do one, you need to decide, you know, what's the degree of substitution with existing technologies? Do you need new money to effect an intervention or can you displace another intervention? So budget impact analysis become even more important if you are coming in and demanding new money. You bring in an intervention that's going to play in the market and you're going to have to bring new money to the, to the, to the, to the fore. And this is very important in areas where there is no good intervention. And I'll give you an example of Sovaldi, which was a hep C treatment, where the side of care was so painful, so expensive, so inefficacious that 
a lot of new money had to be brought to the fore to effect this intervention. Uh, you also have to decide whether it impacts service delivery. I already talked a little bit about whether it affects other healthcare resource use like outpatient visits and hospitalizations. You need to look at the size of the potential population. I'll give an example of Savaldi again in another slide. If you have a huge population, then by all means, you need a budget impact. But if you have a, you know, an orphan indication, a rare cancer, and there's a thousand patients in the US, the system can absorb that uh, very easily, even at a very high price. Uh, the other thing is, you know, if the person who's going to make the decision thinks affordability is important, then you need one. In the US, just by the way the society runs, it's not so much that affordability is a problem. I don't want to get into theory a lot, but essentially the US healthcare is not a right. You know, healthcare is not a right. So when healthcare spending in the US goes up, it displaces other areas of the economy. And the US spends a lot on healthcare like the sheer numbers are very <laughs> incomprehensible uh, to even think about. But in other countries like the UK, there's a fixed amount of money for healthcare and everything has to play within that budget. And you know, in economics, that's the, uh, the difference between welfare economics and extra welfare. So in the UK, affordability is super important because for every new money you demand for a new intervention, something else has to fall by the wayside. But in the US, a good intervention that adds value, essentially will displace something else depending on consumer demand. So this is the example I wanted to give that I always like to use in budget impact. So there was this new drug in 2013 for chronic hepatitis C. And this was, well, this, at the point, this was an incurable condition and it came in as a cure. And, you know, th th this is very interesting because the, essentially hep C would cause, you know, liver damage and people needed transplants. They used interferon. So it was costly and painful. Both the cost side and the outcome side was significant. Things like, you know, liver transplants, you know, uh, liver damage, you know, early mortality. But the initial cost was 84,000 for a 12 week course. Essentially 84 pills, $1,000 a pill. And I always like to joke, I got this joke from one of my mentors, Sean Sullivan, who said, what happens if you drop it in, you know, on the bathroom floor? <laughs> I definitely pick it up at that price. <laughs> and then, you know, but the, study, the cost effectiveness studies showed that it was highly cost effective in some jurisdictions. You know, 13,000 is highly cost effective in the US as is 55. <laughs> but the budget impact was severe. If you paid at that price, you'd need you know, billions of dollars to be able to cover the population because it's a high prevalence condition. Another example is in the UK when statins came, came out at the beginning of the statin era. There was guidance that people, you know, imagine all Britons and everyone who is in the patient population for using statins, so about 8% of the British population. And they did a study, I've forgotten the name of the guy, but they did a study and showed that you would need to put up about 20% of the, the UK uh, budget to cover everyone at the price, at the price at the time for statins. So essentially they said, we can't cover this for everyone who would actually benefit, but we're going to cover those who would benefit even more, who are those who are at high risk for a second myocardial infarction, meaning that they had an initial myocardial infarction. So essentially what you do is that you try to predict the change in expenditure in a system uh, with finite resources. I put it in brackets because you know, resources are finite regardless uh, by adoption and diffusion of a new technology. I'll talk about diffusion in a minute. And it's a short-term analysis. I talked about how it's not a, uh, an economic evaluation. One of the big differences is that in economic evaluation, we both have the societal perspective so general benefits to society. And we also have this concept of net present value. So discounting over a long time period, meaning that we have preferences for benefits on the front end and preferences for money today. I, if you want to give me a hundred bucks, I want it today, not tomorrow because of investment potential and you know, and other reasons. But essentially you provide a framework for stakeholders to examine the impact of changes in technology mix and changes in treatment costs. 
And most deliverables for budget impacts are usually spreadsheets that people can change uh, because there's, we shall see how a lot of the parameters are actually assumptions because they are uncertain by definition. And I said about, I talked about complementarity. You nearly, you never need a budget impact if an intervention hasn't proved value and is not under consideration for, uh, for essentially including on a formulary or including in a certain jurisdiction. So it's a complement to economic evaluation. So the uses are usually, you know, for budget planning, forecasting, and, you know, uh, assessing fiscal impacts. And, you know, the analysis is not so much for a single intervention. And the reason is that for most disease areas or most indications, there's usually another list of interventions in that jurisdiction. So for example, if you're an area that I study, which is breast cancer, heart to positive breast cancer, a new drug like pertuzumab uh, comes in in the context of other drugs like, you know, uh, Herceptin, and there's other chemotherapy drugs as well. So you're coming in to say, you know, if I add this new intervention, how is it going to affect the dynamics within the entire indication? And, you know, that brings me to metrics. So the metrics for BIA are related to who the budget holder is. We like to say in poor countries that the perspective of the analysis is the government. But like I said at the beginning, the government doesn't pay for most of healthcare. And yet we have the dilemma of out of pocket because there are you know, a multitude of uh, payers because of that out of pocket column. But if it's the government and you have a big population in your area of study, one of the main things you're trying to say is that, you know, if you adopt this intervention, it might cost you X percent of your budget. That means that you're telling them that this is probably something you don't want to even do. Or this is a very, very small percent of your budget and something that you should consider. Now in the US, if it's a plan, usually the budget impact studies I've done in the US are usually cost per member per month, which is the denominator is the entire plan, like group health, you know, maybe 4 million lives, or cost per treated member per month, which is the population of people who have that disease, like breast cancer. Cost per member per month says, you know, this intervention is going to change premiums. It's going to make everyone's premium need to be bumped up by X percent. A treated member means that it's a very high cost condition or it's a low cost condition. That allows you know, people to decide whether this is something they want to include uh, in their formularies. Actually, talking about formularies, in the, in the Pacific Northwest, there's one of the world's first value-based formularies at Primera. Essentially, they do, they, the copay, your copay is dependent upon cost effectiveness studies and budget impact studies of the different drugs that are on the formulary. So if you have uh, something that's not very cost effective, then you pay a higher premium, a higher copay, sorry. Pay a higher copay even if you're covered under uh, that, uh, that plan. And this is to drive uh, prescribers towards more high value interventions. So the difference is, I'll go very quickly through this, uh, is you know, CA is about value, uh, BIA is about affordability. There's you know, ROI, which is an efficiency question, this is a, quality of resource consumption question. There are no outcomes in BIA. Here you have you know, a slew of outcomes mm -hmm. that we can talk about. The normative uh, perspective in cost effectiveness is a search perspective. You include costs and benefits across the, all sectors. But here you just want, you know, you're just looking at a single pair. And you know, we have ISAs here. Here we have absolute cost savings. Um, and then, you know, this is, you know, the value, a lower ISA is cost effective here, a lower cost is increased affordability. You have this willing, willingness to pay threshold here. There's no metric for individual assessment. And then discounting, you don't discount uh, in budget impacts. So new interventions usually increase cost, but not always. Uh, 
especially if you are in implementation science, if you're in oper operations research. In fact, we're usually aiming in implementation to reduce cost. So you can have negative budget impact. But at the cutting edge of you know, innovation, usually they'll increase cost. However, you also have this cost offset, which is a new intervention in addition to increasing life expectancy, might reduce hospitalization, might reduce nursing care visits, and even costs of palliative care, for example, might make patients feel better. So a lot of the work in budget impacts is trying to identify that cost offset, actually in cost effectiveness analysis as well. And, uh, you know, budget impact analysis are cost heavy. That's why Carol is here, because she's a costing specialist, but they are really costing heavy analysis. So there are six steps, and I won't dwell on this because uh, I, I'm sure that others are gonna speak more about this, but you want to characterize the population, select a time horizon, usually three to five years, then determine the current and future mix of interventions. This is critical. If you have a displacement intervention, then you take out what you're displacing, but if you have an add-on, then you need to do characterizations and decide what's going to be displaced by what rate, and then you do the cost side, and then you do the cost offset, and then you present results. So I'll give a simple example, and then I'll hand over to, uh, to Carol. So we did a study in the context of a student uh, project a few years ago uh, to try and see the budget impact of including uh, the rotavirus vaccination uh, in, the, in Uganda's EPI program. And at the time it was a new, vi uh, a new vaccine, now it's sort of, uh, you know, it's in its infancy and it's cost effective. All the models out there show it was cost effective. But we wanted to see, you know, how would it affect the healthcare budget in Uganda? And then we wanted to also analyze the impacts on Gavi and Gavi's commitment because it's, Gavi is a major player in this space in a country like Uganda. So we needed an analytic framework. We used the decision tree, we used Uganda's Ministry of Health, you know, and Gavi, because Gavi actually, you know, partnered as the Ministry of Health. We had a 2018 to 2020 time horizon. And this is critical. We made an assumption com completely out of the heart that it would increase 25% per year to 75% in 2020. This is completely out of a heart. And this is why I said that the deliverables in budget impact are essentially spreadsheets because you want to be able to change that 25% and you know, decide what you believe is going to be your rate of diffusion of the new technology in your jurisdiction. And we use published data for efficacy and we use numbers from UN and you know, UN census because essentially this vaccine reduces not just mortality, but it reduces outpatient visits and hospitalizations. I won't go into the model, but it was a simple decision tree model. It was, you know, vaccinated, not vaccinated, you know, with program, no program, vaccination, no vaccination, then diarrhea, then outpatient visits and hospitalizations. And these are the data, which I won't go into detail, but, you know, we had the population. This is all, all of Uganda, growth rates, you know, number of births, the birth cohorts, this is the diffusion rate, and then we had, you know, uh, if you're vaccinated and, you do, and you're not vaccinated, what's the difference is in diarrhea and severe diarrhea, which is a proxy for outpatient and hospitalization. And then, you know, prices and costs, including the cost of hospitalization, which should be one of the main cost offsets. And this is very small, but, you know, these are just like I said, it's an accounting exercise. So, you know, we had, you know, all these you know, millions of dollars uh, across the years with the increase in diffusion of the virus. And BIAs usually do what we call deterministic sensitivity analysis one way. And the main driver here was vaccine price. So essentially the phase in introduction of this vaccine uh, would, would, in Uganda would cost, you know, just 5 million in 2018, going up to 11 in 2019 and 18 in 2020, driven by those increases in coverage, complete assumptions. And it would be, you know, 
just under 1% of domestic healthcare expenditure. And this domestic is not all healthcare expenditure, it's just Ministry of Health, because that was the payer that we targeted. And it's, you know, Gavi at the time had committed just 20 million, which was 40% less than what it would cost given our assumption. So the idea was, you know, what does Gavi think about this and, you know, would they consider uh, increasing uh, their commitments? So that's sort of, uh, you know, just to summarize, it's, you know, in the context of, you know, health technology assessment, uh, cost effectiveness analysis are not enough because you can have an intervention that's of high value, high cost, but really high benefit. But if you consider the population of that intervention, then, you know, it might be substantial depending on which budget holder uh, you are looking at. And these analyses are, you know, very interesting to me in the, in the context of thinking about how health systems work in poor countries, but potentially of really high value, not just in implementation science research, but for policymakers increasingly in poor countries. It's just that you have to uh, really tailor analysis to specific uh, stakeholders. Thanks.